Hello friends, Ben Ochart here. Welcome to today's cichlids and uh, you know the rest, cichlids and coffee or cichlids and tea, right? Amon? And uh, Craig, Craig, Roderick, I'm glad you could catch a live one. I appreciate that all the way from Australia. Hey KG, glad you're here buddy and uh, hope you're doing well. And who else do we have here? Let's see. Richard Maloney. Richard Maloney, do you have stickers? If you don't have stickers, send me an uh, email. Send me your address. You were first on the chat, to ben.o.cichlid at gmail.com. I'll send you some stickers, my friend. And uh, Amon came in strong here with uh, the first super chat before I even arrived. Thank you, my friend. That is appreciated. Last week's uh, big shout-out to... Um, let me see here if I can find them. Last week, we had... Last week, you super chatters went crazy. There they are. And uh, James Wheatley, Amon Fountain, Lionfish. Looks like, looks like Florida, New York fish. Naomi H2O came in big last week. Uh, GP, Jerry's Fish Room, and Pompey Ranch. Thank you so much, super chatters. You are very, very appreciated. For those of you who don't know, Super Chatting is a way to support the channel by throwing a little hash at the channel, and it is always very, very appreciated. So uh, we have a few more folks getting on here. Let's see. Uh, let's let a few of them get on. Hey, James Green, good morning to you. And um, Tom over at Neptune's Net eating some delicious seafood. and. Uh, I'm very, very jealous. Morning all from Z-Zip. Hello, Z-Zip. Hispanic mechanic. Buenos dias, amigo. Encuentras bien? Okay. John Wallace. All ears today. And uh, I have so much to talk about. I am... Um, we have a... The setting up of a tank, as I'm learning here, involves so many factors, and today I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite topics as well as a few others. We're going to talk about tank location and placement. We're going to talk about uh, water availability, uh, both from what's available to you externally, but also uh, you know how that relates to fish that you're keeping. We're going to talk about the true cost of setting up an aquarium, which in the excitement of buying a tank and a lid at the local pet store, uh, you have no idea what you're getting into, especially if you're getting into a, a big tank. And um, we're going to also get into one of my, and I think one of your favorite subjects, uh, filtration, and really how to, uh, you know, things to consider when, when you're going to be uh, filtering a large 
a very large tank. So uh, before we get into that, let's go ahead and uh, do the official the the official start of the live stream. If you're new to the channel, uh, you can join a great group of fish keepers at Facebook, Facebook at ben.o.cichlid, very helpful group of people, and also behind the scenes on Instagram at ben.o.cichlid. I post things uh, unrelated to fish and also uh, some behind the scenes look at the tanks, things you wouldn't see on Facebook or rather on uh, YouTube. Also, um, Let's see, don't forget to hit that bell, that sub, and that notification bell. It tells YouTube something good's going on here. Big shout out to the channel sponsor, my friend James over at the Cichlid Shack. Remember with Shack Attack 10, you can get 10% off on any orders over $100. And um, other ways to support the channel is to use the Amazon link to access Amazon and uh, just use amazon.com slash shop slash Ben Ochart. You can get things from the fish store, but also from anywhere on Amazon, and it will support the channel. My wife does all her shopping at uh, the shop slash Ben Ochart. <laughs> at least she says she does. I don't know. <laughs> and if you want a T-shirt, T-shirt like this, we can get the logo, and uh, the back of it says fish keeping is a fluid situation, uh, things like that. You can go. You can get that at Teespring, which is underneath every one of my videos, and uh, no more commercials. So we have a lot to talk about. But before I do that, it looks like someone came in from. Let me see. We got a super chat from Brandon. Brandon comes in with. Uh, not sure what CA is that Canadian CA twenty. Canadian, very, very nice. Thank you so much. I catch all your pre-recorded content and never been, never seem to make it to cichlids and coffee. You inspired, inspired me to rejoin the hobby after five plus years away, jumping right in with a 150. Wow, happened peacock tank. Thank you, sir. You are welcome, my friend. Uh, it really, really makes me happy to hear that because uh, as you know, my stated goal, my sort of mission statement is to create growth in the hobby and to help those who, um, you know, are, are maybe going through a rough patch or struggling and need some help or those who are new and need some guidance. And uh, I pride myself on making the mistakes so that you don't have to. <laughs> and I've made plenty of them, I assure you. Thank you for that, my friend. Very appreciated. Very nice comment. I like that a lot. So uh, welcome Zen Ginger, our newest moderator. Zen Ginger is now a moderator. Thank you, Zen Ginger, for jumping in the uh, moderator group. Moderators are folks who uh, are very familiar with YouTube and volunteer to help out to keep the uh, you know keep things moving and keep them clean and uh, family friendly. So, <laughs> and hey, Tony, it's okay to lurk. You are appreciated. And Brandon says Canada. Good. Okay, C A means Canada. Nate. Hey, Nate. And beautiful state of Texas. I like Texas a lot, Nate. Good friends down there. And uh, just a great scene. Hey, GP. Glad you're here. And our um, our moderator, uh, Jerry. Jerry's Fish Room. Check him out on YouTube. And is not going to be here today. Uh, several, uh, one or two times a month, he goes and helps out disadvantaged individuals, either through food banks and things of this nature, uh, you know, soup kitchen type things. And, um, uh, Jerry's kind of a very special guy. And, um, uh, and so once a month we will not see him. Hispanic mechanic tells me that audio and sound is good. Thank you so much, my friend. I appreciate that. And in case you figured out, I too am Hispanic. I'm the Hispanic fish keeper. So, um, <clears throat> Sun Sun HW 3000 is a beast. John puts in a plug for the Sun Sun 3000. I've never owned one. The biggest Sun Sun I've ever had is a 704B, and that thing is moved a lot of water, moved a tremendous amount of water. My only advice to people on it is uh, be sure to have an extra O-ring. You can pick those up on eBay. Just have one sitting around. 
I put a little bit of food grade silicone on it and put it on after a year or two and it should be fine. Don't let the hoses kink. Keep the hoses as short as they can be uh, you know, to the, to the unit and to the tank and uh, you'll do, it'll do great. It'll run for years and years. I think Sun Suns are okay. I have both Sun Suns and Flubles. I have not tried um, Eheims. I've heard great things about Eheim. I haven't tried the um, Oas, Oase. Haven't tried those. They look like they're pretty cool too. And I hope to try one someday. And uh, Kaler's Aquatics and Exotics. Hello, Kaler. Kaler's here. Fred Broderick, good day, Bob. And all right. Let's go ahead and jump into the... Uh, and thank you so much for those super chats. Very appreciated. If I miss if I miss one while I'm gabbing, it just means that while I'm delivering content, I don't want to be distracted. So I kind of keep my eye off of the chat. So uh, let let's get let's talk about let's talk about the uh, five new tank setup points and. Uh, the first one, it 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 kind of borrows, uh, borrows the uh, the idea from real estate. You know, real estate. They say, what's the best? What are the top three things to know about buying real estate? Right, location, location, location. Same thing with with your tank. You've got to really, really give location and placement uh, some thought. Now, if I, if things hadn't sort of transpired the way they did. And, I'm not, and I don't want to make excuses because the truth is I, I, I could have done a better job and uh, maybe recruited some help and, and uh, had things ready you know, more effectively than I did. But that, that 210 that's right here, on, right here on my right side, I'm either going to have to put a big black back, backdrop behind it so that it looks, um, you know, so that it doesn't have the clutter of the of the storage area of the garage behind it, or I'm going to have to uh, recruit some help, and and get get these tanks moved and use it as the backdrop for here, which is going to be a a, tr a a tremendous exercise. We're talking about the removing of all the fish, the draining of the tanks. The, the removing of the substrate and keeping the beneficial bacteria viable in the substrate because that is rich with beneficial bacteria. Then moving that all into, you know, moving the, the tanks away from the wall, moving the 210 against the wall, making sure it's level, and then adding that to it. Now, in an ideal world, those 55s would have been away from the wall already when they delivered the 210 and the 210 could have been slipped in place. Now, the reason that I, I was on the fence about doing that is because I have a lot of plumbing to do behind the, uh, behind the 210. I have 20 feet of inch and a half PVC pipe. I have uh, inch and a half gate valves like this. This is called a gate valve, and it helps control the, the flow of, you can see, it helps control the flow of the overflow system as the water goes back into the tank. I have return valves that I have to uh, return. This is a uh, one-way valve that will prevent water siphoning back into the sump from the uh, return hose. And I've got six or so of these elbows. For the kind of turns and things I have to do, and this is a pipe reamer. So when I cut pipe, I can ream it and make the edges nice and smooth. I have, I have a lot of plumbing to do, and that plumbing needs some space, and so I'm going to need to work behind it. So I was reluctant to put it here, even though I could have put it there with some space and then finished the plumbing and then had some people come over and help me and move it closer. So you know what? Where there's a problem, there's a solution. So I'm not going to sit here and make excuses. I should have planned that better. And that talks to point number one, location. Other points to consider on location. Let's take a look at those. Uh, the weight is the weight bearing. Uh, yeah, the, is the floor weight bearing? 
and maybe with a 29 gallon, maybe, maybe even a 55 or a 75, you really don't have to concern yourself too much about that unless you're on a, unless you have very flimsy construction. But, um, I mean, think about it. People bring in, uh, bookcases and fill them up with books. I mean, a tremendous amount of weight, right? But, uh, if you have a, a a wall in your in your home that's a support has is, is a supporting wall and has some major beams in it, you're probably going to be okay. You start getting up into the, you know, maybe around one twenty five. One twenty five with a big sump, that's a lot of weight. You start getting up into one fifty, one eighty, two hundred plus, and y- you need to start considering: is my floor if not going to cave in altogether, is it going to bow or buckle or things of that nature? So, and there are things you can do. You can get under the house. You can buy, um, there, they are, they have jacks or if you want to cut some, some, you know, six by six, four by four lumber, you, you can get in there and hammer in support for your floor so that the weight will be, you know, will be held easily. I think Evan Alexander, uh, IFG, he's got an enormous tank that he put in his house. I'm, I'm, I don't know, what is it, 300, 500? I forget. It's a massive tank. I think, I know he put tiles under it, and then he put pads, and I think underneath, unless he's on a concrete slab, but I think he put some support there. But support, you, you can't, you, you, you can't uh, take that for granted. It's one of those things that if it happens, it's massive. It's a massive expense, apart from probably losing the tank because at that at a you know at a caved in angle, it's probably going to burst on you. So, <clears throat> that's right, GP. Everything is going to be dry fitted, and also you know something to think about is when you when you put a pipe into something. And these are the wrong size, but you, you'll be able to tell if you if you need if you need the pipe to be a certain angle, you need to have that marked. You need to put a marker here and here so the angle is right. So you mark it with a marker with a with a dry erase marker because if you and then you when you put it in you you line up the lines after, because otherwise you can end up gluing them and you're off a little bit and now this doesn't go to the tank it goes somewhere else. So <laughs> you have to make sure everything is marked perfectly. Uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, unions, unions are so popular. This is, this is called a union. For those of you who someday are going to be plumbing their tank. And with a union, you have the, here you have, you have the pipe this way, right? And a pipe this way. And you want to disconnect the pipes. You just undo the union. You undo the union and you're separate. You can take things out, put them in, and you can turn the angle of the pipe to fit what you need and then tighten it down in that angle. See? So unions are are amazing. You need a lot of unions when you're doing a build, you're doing PVC uh, plumbing. So at any rate, I get I get distracted. Weight bearing. Make sure you have good weight bearing on the floor. Make sure you consider that. Uh, Access to outlets. Do you have access to electrical outlets, or are you going to do a, uh, you know, a a ten outlet, a ten outlet unit, right? One of those strips, and then plug a strip into the strip, and then a strip into that strip. <laughs> so you end up with this daisy chain that would make any police, uh, any any fire department captain, uh, you know, scream. So. Um, be sure you have correct uh, electrical outlets available. Some people like to use the, uh, the, the ground, you know, the ones that are grounded that, that actually will, um, that will turn, that will actually cut power in the event of some kind of an issue. The only problem with those that I've heard is that if you ever have a power outage and they flip, they flip off and you're not home, let's say the power comes back on after 30 minutes, the power stays off. So it doesn't come back on until you get home and push that reset button. So 
a plus and a minus to those kinds of outlets. Those of you on the stream who know more about elect electronics and uh, wiring, things of that nature, you can chime in on that. But access to outlets. Don't put up your tank and set it up and then realize, wait a minute, the closest outlet is 30 feet away. I have to run this ugly extension cord. So um, how about direct sunlight? Are you going to be hit by direct sunlight? You're going to get a lot of algae growth. You'll probably get um, you know, bearded algae, green algae. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get overrun with algae. If you have plants, you might want a little bit of sunlight, but you can accomplish those things with a full-spectrum LED or a full-spectrum light of any kind can accomplish in a very controlled fashion the amount of, uh, of light, full-spectrum light that you're getting. So really be conscious of um, positioning with regards to lighting. Can you block off the windows? And how about uh, floor and carpet? Before you place your tank, uh, think about that. I mean, if I was to have a spill, and you will have a spill, I don't care who you are, at some point, you're going to get distracted, and your, your bucket is going to overwhelm uh, or overflow. Your tank is going to overflow. Uh, something's going to happen. You're going to have a spill at some point. That, some of that water is going to creep under your stand, and you're not going to be able to get to it. You can run fa you'll run fans and things like that, but if your stand is flush with the floor, you're not going to get, be able to get under it to really dry it. So are, is it a floor that you're willing to get wet? And if it's not, what are you going to do to make sure it stays as protected as possible? You can buy um, heavy-duty rubber mats. You can buy uh, some types of water protection. You know, there are things you can put on there. Some people will cut out the piece of carpet that the tank is going to be on and replace that with linoleum or a tile. And that'll protect that area from water damage. And, and, but that area now becomes an entirely tank-dedicated area, right? You're not going to move the tank and end up with this weird cutout in your living room, right? So things to consider, I mean, down here in the garage, I really don't have hardly any of these considerations with regards to water damage because I have a, a concrete, you know, a treated, a tr specially treated concrete floor, and I don't care if it gets wet. So it can, you know, I can have a flood. It's okay. It's okay with me. So um, access to a water source. Th th this, th this is key. And I, and I went backwards here. I gave you concern over floor and carpet damage. But access to a water source. Are you close to a sink? Are you close to some type of a water source? And is it a water source that you can control the temperature of? I had to have a sink put in, you know, right here over my shoulder where you see some of the um, cleaning, you see some of the cleaning items back there. I had to have that, that put in because uh, I had no sink down here. Otherwise, what would, I, what would I have to do? I would have had to run a hose. I would have to run a hose from the sink in the kitchen all the way down to fill up tanks and while that was going on, nobody else would be able to use the faucet in the kitchen, and that would have made me very, very, um, very, very unpopular. So, <laughs> so the uh, definitely, definitely something to consider on water source and have the right kind of connections and hookups. There are adapters you can get for your Python systems. There are adapters if you have a Python or an Aquion. Be sure to check your faucet, the head of your faucet. Make sure that it is something that you can put an adapter on and put your Aquion on. I've had people post pictures like at the Facebook group. They have a very high-end faucet in their kitchen, you know, $300, $400, beautiful faucet, right, one of these long you know long uh, curved numbers that pull out and you know does that makes espresso for you and it it has no way to attach an aquion to it no way to attach a python so they're they're kind of stuck so just something to consider now child and pet proof now this is something i you know i'm a fan as you know of um, john and lisa hudson over at uh, K kg tropicals 
not to be confused with KG cichlids, right, Kevin? <laughs> Whatever, KG tropicals. And I remember sometimes you'd have that cat, you know, that cat running around and getting on top of the tanks. And, you know, I'd, I'd be there holding my breath. You'd... So is, is your setup going to be, you know, is it going to be fully, fully pet proof? I started limiting how, how much my dogs get in here because my, my, one of my beagles was jumping up and actually getting the water to actually move. He was jumping up so hard on the tank, going after the fish, chasing them back and forth and, and, and jumping up on the tank that there was actually water sloshing around. And I caught him doing it and I, I uh, sent him back up the stairs. And now I have a little gate up there or else he'd be down here doing it right now. It's pretty cute. He picks out a particular fish and usually the Bucachromis and chases it back and forth 20 times. But um, I don't like that. Now, what about a child? Can a child get, get into the, ele the, the electrical? I mean, you've got water and, ele and electrical together there. Can the child get into it? Can the child hold on to the top rim of your tank? And maybe perhaps try and climb up. I mean, these are things that, you know, as a father of four, having had to have a house childproof for years, kind of things that make you cringe, right? Kid can pull that tank down on them and you'd, you'd have a world of hurt. So you have to think in terms of childproofing. I've seen people who have, who have put uh, special, uh, you know, gating and things <laughs> like, like pool gating. You know, you can't climb them around the base of the aquarium because their kid was, you know, using the the shelving to, you know, to step on and get up into the, you know, into the display area. And you can't blame them. You really can't blame them. Doesn't mean that when they get big enough, they're not going to pull a chair over and try something, but you know, do your best to make it as childproof as possible and as pet proof as possible. So, <clears throat> and, and last, and, and, and in some ways, uh, very, very important. Are you going to be able to position your tank in a place where you're going to be able to enjoy it? to just sit there and enjoy it. I mean, one of my best parts of the day is to come down here and turn this chair around and, and view these tanks and sit here and observe what's going on. And um, it's just very, very relaxing. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And, you know, are you going to have your tank in a remote room, in a, uh, in a remote hallway, in, in a, you know, a second floor landing somewhere where you're, going to rarely see it except when you walk by or you no know, you want to have it where where you can enjoy it and also where where guests can enjoy it you know friends and 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 you know i used to love it when people come over to the house and they're delivering something they're picking something up they're a friend of one of the kids and they would they, whoa what is that you know is that a salt water tank you know i used to love that used to love that and, and asking me questions about it especially if it was somebody coming over and they had kids and their little six or seven year old was, you know, just going crazy looking at the fish and asking questions. And of course, in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, future fish keeper. And uh, so we get into long discussions about African cichlids and where they're from and how they, you know, how they act and things of that nature. So anyway, things to consider on location. So let's get rid of that and let's talk a little bit about types of water available. And that one is pretty simple. And this, but this could determine the kind of fish that you're going to ultimately keep. I mean, if you move to an area and you have a very high pH, uh, very hard water, I highly recommend that you get that you get fish that are going to be able to live in that kind of water instead of constantly trying to treat the tank to try and, and reduce pH or increase, you know, change your KH or GH. And it's, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's not, it, it's not precise when you start doing that. And we've all heard the saying, right? You're better off having your fish adapt to a pH that might be slightly out of ideal range, that's in the long run a stable pH. That's probably better than a you know, trying to get your fish, uh, trying to get your pH, trying to dial in your pH with you know your you're you're doing stuff with with you know 
baking soda and you're you're you're, you're doing stuff with calcium and you're, you're doing all this all this sort of stuff and you're you're buying you're buying buffering agents and pH up pH down products and and uh, it it really it 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 really is a very um, a very inaccurate unprecise sort of science and so uh, you're so if you have water parameters that are very soft for example you might want to go in the direction of soft you know fish that need that you know that might be a good a good opportunity to do to do a discus tank or you know fish that that like it around six five six you know things of that nature so um <clears throat> Also, one just sort of a little bit of a t of a tip here is, and and I talked about this when I talked about testing, and that is one of the most important tests and often forgotten or neglected test is to test the tap, because there are uh, things going on. I mean, I had a a person one time comment, and they were on a well. They never worried about their water. They never treated their water, because it was always this pure. You know, spring water this that was coming in, this well water that was coming in, and it was always perfect. And well, guess what? Uh, there was uh, some heavy rain. The farmers were adding tremendous amounts of nitrogen nitrites right to the to the farming area. They spilled into his well, and he had some problems. So, a uh, test test what's coming out of your tap. If you're going to do a test, unless your fish are acting up and and looking odd, doing something funny. Uh, you know that's up to you. You want to test if they're look if something looks off. I, yes, test your tank, and certainly test your tap because very often that's where some of the problems can can spring from. So be aware of the type of water. Now let's talk a little bit about true uh, true cost. Before I do that, let's take a look here at the um, at the chat because. We've had a lot go on here. I notice uh, Kaler's Aquatics and Exotics came in with a super chat. Thank you, Kaler. Very appreciated. Hoping to see you, Ben, at CAAS Fish Swap next month. Great to have you as a fellow Tennessean. Can you please send me information on that? Just send it to ben.o.cichlid at gmail because this is the first time I've heard about this. and. Uh, I can't guarantee I'll be there. I'm I'm uh, I'm the one-legged man in the butt kicking contest right now with everything I have going on, but I uh, I'll try and make it there if I can. But uh, thank you, Kayla, for that super chat. That is very appreciated. And uh, did I miss any super chats? Okay. All right. Let's get back here. Let's get into uh, cost. Actual true cost. Because this is something again, in the excitement of buying a tank, you know, you run into uh, PetSmart, you pick up that seventy-five, and you, you you put it in the you put it in the back of the pickup, and you take it home, and you end up with a lot of things. And um, this tank that I have here, and I'll I'll see if I can turn this. Let me see if I can turn this and show it to you. This is for those of you that haven't seen. That's the uh, that's the two ten, and uh, I'll close these windows just real quick here so you can take a, a complete look at it. You can see behind it there's a lot of storage and things of that nature, but um, and it doesn't you can't really tell how big it is really. But let me I'll, I'll give you a perspective. get an idea how big i mean how big that thing is it's uh it's six feet across uh i don't know how far front to back maybe 20 22 23 it's very tall much taller than i would normally like to have because um i'd like a tank that i can reach down into and reach the bottom 
I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm going to have to be up on a ladder when I need to work on the uh, on the bottom of the tank. I'm going to have to buy a you know a five foot siphon hose, <laughs> five foot siphon tube. So I, I'll probably DIY a siphon tube for it. But uh, so when when I'm looking at this tank, okay, so you have the tank itself. If you go to uh, glass cages, you're probably going to end up uh, spending about fifteen hundred bucks for a tank like this. The stand, you're going to spend another uh, three hundred, maybe, maybe between yeah, around three hundred for a custom made stand, unfinished. So as you can see, I need to finish. I need to finish this stand. Then uh, let's look at other things. Go ahead and open that window again. So you have the initial cost of the uh, of the tank and stand, and that's just the beginning. You have to consider what is this going to run? What is this going to run with regards to utility? I'm going to be running a um, Chise, she sells seashores by the seashore Chise. This is a Chise 9.0 Synchra Advanced, and it is going to pump 2,500 gallons an hour, and it's going to use or consume 50 watts. Oh, no, I'm sorry, reading that wrong. 90 watts, a 90-watt pump. Very powerful unit. Now, I do have a DC pump from Hyger. My friends over at Hyger, that is adjustable. If this pump overwhelms my sump, which I am DIYing, it's it's behind me. I just uh, I just siliconed in one of the one of the baffles. You've never seen such a big silicone mess in your life, and now I've got to put another baffle in. And uh, by the time I was done in the garage here uh, with my head in the 29, trying to put the silicone in. I was absolutely, uh, I had a headache and I was, I was uh, partially high from the silicone and I was just in real bad shape. I just stumbled back up the stairs. <laughs> Always uh, do silicone in a well-ventilated area. Uh, that's my takeaway. So, so Your utility costs are going to go up because I'm running. I'm going to be running the pump. I'm going to be running the lights. I'm going to be running a um, a Fluval FX6 on this thing. The Fluval FX6 will be on the right side. The Synergy Overflow is on the left. The Synergy Overflow is the one that needs. I need to run three one and a half inch pipes down. Two of them go into the sump, and one of them is an emergency overflow. It's called an animal bean or bean animal. One's an overflow. Uh, that's for emergencies. So I'm going to be doing that plumbing. I've got to cut the back of the tank out because it's a solid piece of wood in the back. Uh, not solid, but, you know, of course, press wood, but it's, it's a, it's a, the back is completely sealed off. So I've got a, I've got a miter saw. I'm going to go ahead and cut that open so I can get the plumbing in. And uh, so I've got 160, I have two over 200 pounds of substrate that I bought. I have crushed coral. I have eco-complete uh, black, uh, eco-complete Zach black, and I have um, the Imaginarium black. I'm going to be mixing them, hopefully ending up with a bit of gray. And uh, so I want to end up with a three-inch substrate. Well, what did that cost me? There's several hundred dollars in just substrate. The lighting, uh, JCMP is helping me out on that. I'm going to do a full review of JCMP lights. and uh, But you would spend, on a tank like this, you would spend probably 100 to $200 on regular lighting, LED-type lighting, and you can go on up from there. I mean, if you go into some, some of the higher-end units, you can spend many hundreds of dollars. Why? Because you need the lumens, you need the power, uh, to be able to reach all the way to the bottom of a tank that's you know about 25 inches tall, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to have 
very strong lighting. Otherwise, it's just not going to reach the bottom. It's going to be very dimly lit near the bottom. So uh, you're going to spend several hundred dollars on lighting. You're going to spend, uh, and I'm not even, let's talk about heaters. Heaters are an area where you don't go cheap. Don't go cheap on heaters. Don't cut corners on heaters. Unless you have a room that's climate controlled and you don't need heaters, which I think is the ideal if you don't mind sitting in 78, you know, 78 degrees. Right now, I'm not running heaters. This, this, this garage is about 70, 78 degrees right now. My tanks are staying at uh, 78.4 and 78.8 with no heaters running. The heaters have been pulled out. So you know how hot, you know how hot this room is. But in the wintertime, in the wintertime, it can get, it got down to 10 degrees last winter. So this, this garage, though insulated, is, is going to need, need some assistance. So I'm going to need heaters inside the tanks. To heat a 210-gallon, I'm going to need 1,000 watts, maybe more than that. What is it, 5 watts per gallon, right? So 1,000 watts, two 500-watt heaters, running into a very high-end controller. I'm not talking Inkbird. This is not a, this is not a, uh, I use Inkbird controllers, they're fine. But for a tank this size, I bought one of those heavy-duty Gemco, 100, you know, I have one of those $100 two-plug controllers. So the heater will be plugged into that, and the heater will probably be in the sump. The problem with having a heater in a sump is that if something goes wrong with your pump, and you're, you're away for four hours or five hours, your tank isn't getting any heat, and the temperature can drop very sharply if it's very cold outside. So I'm probably going to have to have a heater in the sump and possibly a heater cleverly concealed somewhere in the tank and both of those plugged into the controller. Of course, if you have a power outage, or if it uh, doesn't matter, it's going to cool down anyway. But that would be just safeguarding against pump failure. If the pump is no longer moving water up to the tank, then you're going to have a tank that's going to cool down very quickly if your heater is only in the sump. So, <clears throat> Denny, you never have to apologize to me for being late. Moderators are volunteers, and any time that you put in is greatly appreciated, my friend. Never forget that. So, uh, let's talk about water movement. Again, you go with a big tank, you're going to need, you're, you're talking Ecotech, you're talking uh, tons, uh, you're talking uh, very high-end, uh, very high-end wave makers that are going to deliver between 25, maybe 2,500 gallons per hour or more to be able to move water in a tank that size. And I want water movement. Because when I'm using a sand substrate, I want the particles, I want the detritus suspended so it can get sucked into the, the, filter, the filtration. So I'm going to have to put at least two, two very strong power heads. And those, are going, those would normally run maybe $100 each if you go high end, maybe between $50 and 100 Sure, you can pick up some Sun Sun power heads for about 25 bucks that'll move over 2,000 gallons per hour. That'll be okay. They're, they're fine. They're going to be, they're gonna be a, a bit noisier. They're going to have a higher failure rate. Their uh, life is going to be shorter. But the reduced cost, they're almost disposable. They're almost like the canisters. Okay, you buy two Sun Suns canisters and one is a backup or one is the one that you use for parts so that if your son's and you're still coming in much cheaper than a high-end canister if you want to operate that way that's your call right so um increased utility costs initial cost of tanks lids stands etc cost of heaters controllers water movement and you have the on, you know, the one-time cost versus ongoing expenses. And this is why sometimes you're better off going with high-end if it's a one-time cost. You buy a, a, a tons power head. You buy a, an Ecotech. You buy a, a, uh, one of the, the higher units. 
you know, one of the high end power heads, it's, it's probably going to last you the life of the tank. I was over at Bulk Reef Supply. You, you can imagine how many videos I've been watching recently about sumps and salt water and top 20 sump mistakes and how to, how to plumb, how to, how to work your overflows. I've been watching nonstop these videos. And one of the comments one of the folks made at Bulk Reef Supply, they said, and you'll like this, Jay Wilson, if, you, if you're lurking around, they said that your, your Shisei pump will outlast your aquarium. That, that you'll probably end up selling it when you sell your tank, that it's not going to fail. That's a pretty strong endorsement from uh, Bulk Reef Supply. Those guys know what they're talking about. Now, will the Hyger that I was sent, will that perform that way? Would a, uh, a Chinese you know, DC, direct current, with variable speed control, would that kind of pump last that long? You read the reviews, some people say they've had great experiences with them. Some people say it's was noisy, uh, failed after, you know, after the first 3 months. So, you know, CJ stands behind their stuff. I think up to 5 years they'll they'll either replace or fix. And regardless, the pump is the heart of your um, of your system if you're using a sump, so you should have a backup pump. Some people run two pumps in their sump so that if one fails, they're still, they're still moving water. In my case, I use the sump, but I'm also using the, uh, the fluval. I am going to be putting the fluval in a large plastic container and I am going to have a water sensor under the tank in case there's any kind of, and there are water sensors out there for like 10, 15 bucks that sound like a fire alarm. Uh, if they detect uh, a large amount of moisture under the tank, you can pick them up at Bulk Reef Supply. You can pick them up on eBay, Amazon. You throw that thing down there, and if it picks up any any moisture, it goes off. Some of them will even send a text to your phone and say, "Hey, listen, you got you got a spill." Now, if I was in California on hardwood floors, that text would be very very alarming. But you know, a text like that, I guess, would be alarming anyway. You don't know what's going on. You don't know how fast it's spilling. Do you have a tank burst or do you have a, uh, a slow leak? Anyway, so things to keep in mind. On one-time cost and expenses, you might be better off going high-end. I look at substrate that way. Some people will rag on me, Ben, you're wasting money. Why didn't you just use play sand? Why didn't you just get diamond, black diamond blasting sand? Why didn't you? I get it. I get it. That would have saved me money. I understand. I just like I, I just like sand that that is provided by a company that is making it for fish, and they're tumbling it so that there's no sharp edges, so that you have sift. If you have fish that are sifting through the sand a lot, uh, they're not going to uh, they're not going to irritate their gills, their lips. That's not going to happen. And all the fish I have, most of them, the geos in particular, and certainly the African cichlids, are they sift? They like to sift sand, and so uh, I like uh, I like to use a better end sand. And it's a one-time purchase; it's one and done. And in my case, I'll probably have a hundred pounds extra. So we'll see. <laughs> so one-time cost versus ongoing cost. Now, um, what other costs are there? We talked about lighting needs. Uh, we talked about filtration. You decide which way you want to go, how much you want to spend there. A media, are you going to go with, are you going to go sort of, uh, I'm not going to say on the cheap. I'm just going to say it's a different philosophy. Are you going to do like I'm doing where you're going to rely on your, on your um, thick sand bed to be the home of beneficial bacteria? which is what I'm doing, or are you going to uh, really in, you know, operate off the philosophy that you want media to be carrying that load, in which case do you go with your biohomes and your marine pures and your matrixes and things like that that are going to cost big bucks, or do you go cheap? Do you rely on sponges for that? Do you rely on garden pumice that you can buy at the garden store? Or, or perhaps uh, broken up lava rock 
like Joey talks about, the king of DIY. He loves lava rock. So again, choices you have to make, things you need to think about as you start to prepare and budget, you know, budget your aquarium. And that's nothing to consider, budget. I mean, if you're, if you're going paycheck to paycheck and you love tropical fish, I don't know. Uh, a second job, uh, you know, you're going to need some, you know, it, there's costs. There's going to be costs. And that money's going to come from somewhere. And where, where you can save money and go budget, you know, go on the cheap without compromising the quality of life for your fish. If you're in that kind of situation, absolutely. And uh, places where I say don't don't cut corners, don't go cheap. Heaters, controllers, uh, and uh, fish food. Don't go bargain fish food. Get the best fish food you can get your your hands on. That's going to be that's going. There's another cost involved. I like extreme. I love the way it smells. I love the way my fish react to it. I get it from. Um, the channel sponsor over at the Cichlid Shack. I've had, had good results with Northfin. I've had uh, good results with Piscine Energetics, if you can find it. I also use frozen, uh, you know, frozen krill, things of that nature for the African cichlids. So uh, don't cut corners with your food. Other things, especially things like media, even filtration, you can go with big sponges. You can go with expert Maddox. I have expert Maddox in the tank behind me. Those things cost hardly nothing by comparison, and they do a great job. They take 10 to 15 minutes to service. They tell you when they need the service because the bubbles slow way down. In a lot of ways, they're kind of an ideal filter. You get the benefits of a sponge, the benefits of, of a power head, the benefits of a bubbler for about 30 bucks. That's pretty darn good. I think one of them can handle a tank up to about 29 or more. Uh, above 29, you put two in. I got two in the 55 behind me. I have one and, a, and an HOB in this tank. So um, a lot of ways, a lot of ways to save money and still have, uh, you know, still have healthy, healthy fish. So media costs, uh, what else? What else do I have here on the list? If you're thinking of any, if you think of any, go ahead and, and mention them in the chat. Type of fish and the cost of those fish, I mean, that gets into a whole other area of expense. You, know, you want a bunch of unicorn fish. You want uh, mature, colored up male eye biters and uh, sand divers. And you want to get into discus. You want to get into, you know, and you want them big. And you're going to be paying a lot of dough. You're gonna have, you're gonna have four hundred dollars of inventory in a tank. So, uh, yeah, power backups, water sensors, high quality filtration. Uh, yeah, you're, you're gonna want that. Some people, hey, you know what? Every few weeks, go to PetSmart, see what kind of cichlids they have. Throw a fire mouth in there. You know, throw a throw an Oscar in there. Throw a you know. I mean, you can go on the cheap on the fish, too. You want them fully colored up? You're going to pay a premium, and you're probably going to have to buy them from somebody who's not in your area. You're going to pay a lot for shipping. You want to buy small, uh, you, undetermined sex. Uh, it doesn't matter so much with the South American, Central Americans, because the males and females are really both beautiful. But with the African cichlids, you're probably going to want males. Uh, you want to just grow them out. You're probably going to have to buy three or four. You'll buy three or four for 25, 30 bucks, little ones. It'll take you about a year, maybe a little more. If you're impatient, that's not the way to go. You buy three or four, there's a very unlikely that you'll have all females. However, you will probably have one or more die. Uh, that's just how it is when you buy them really small. They're a little bit more fragile. Sometimes, of course, they kill each other. We're talking African cichlids, right? So things to think about, things to think about. Now, someone mentioned clubs, swaps, things of that nature. If you have local breeders, uh, you can get great deals and great fish that way. The advantage, of course, of a local breeder 
is it's being done in your local water, and that's going to have fish that are going to be uh, a lot more comfortable in the switch. I think the uh, pH, GH, KH in Tempe, Arizona is not the same as it is here in Nashville. And so when I get fish sent to me, you know, I've got to watch them really close. I, you know, and because they might go into a little bit, a little bit of a momentary shock. So what did I say? I had a lot to talk about. I'm just going on and on. I'm just rattling on and on. <laughs> All right. Where are we? So that's filtration. Now, did I talk about time commitment? Because with time, with time commitment, the key thing on that is you got to look at your job and you got to look at your family. And I've talked to people who over the years got to a point where because of job and family, they had to leave the hobby and then got back into the hobby later. That happened to me. I mean, I was keeping fish when I was about six years old and I ended up with a job where I had to travel a lot and, uh, you know, four kids, et cetera. And I ended up, I ended up having to uh, and step away from the hobby. And then I ended up coming back to the hobby. So this is something that has to be taken into consideration, especially if you get multi-tank syndrome and, or you go right into a big tank. Does your, you know, do, do you have a few hours a week and is that going to create a problem? And so you've got to look at your, your small children a demanding spouse? Is your spouse supportive of what you do? I think my wife loves that I do this. It keeps me out of her hair. <laughs> Just being honest here. <laughs> so she probably loves the fact that I, you know, I disappear and go off to a fish store somewhere or uh, you know, something like that. She probably really likes that. So at any rate, where I am in life right now, retired, for the most part, apart from, you know, YouTube, live streams, things of that nature. Uh, kids are grown up, self-sufficient. Wife works long hours, uh, tutoring. She tutors uh, virtually, and a lot of her students are back in California. So she's busy most of the day. So my life right now is ideal for fish keeping. If your life has demands, small children, lots of other pets, a farm, things of this nature, consider the time and adjust the commitment, the size of the tank, the type of fish accordingly, or you're going to end up with some problems. And uh, you definitely don't want those problems. So I think I hopped around. I mean, what do you think? Did I miss one? Things to consider before you set up a tank? Location, type of water available, true cost considerations, everything from lighting to substrate to heaters to food, ongoing maintenance, chemicals, water conditioners, on and on and on, right? Filtration, the type of filtration, the cost of filtration. Did I forget anything else? If I did, if I forgot anything that's not on the list, go ahead and put it in the chat. And what I will do is I will probably bring it up at a different live stream because I'm, I'm running long here with all I had to talk about and uh, maybe even do a video on it. So by the way, did you folks, did you folks like, uh, Oh, I have a bonus. I forgot bonus tip. Number six, what types of fish do you want to keep? What are the expenses associated with that? Do these fish require special diets? Warm water, UV, and is the temperament of the fish right for you? So this is just a bonus tip number six. And I've said this before, African cichlids are not for everybody. And if I could cite one reason that's been repeated to me the most over the last few years for why a person has shifted from African cichlids to South Americans or community tanks, it's because of aggression. So... They wake up, and last night everything was good. This morning, a fish is completely shredded. That's not for everybody. I have right now, I have a dragon blood that's keeping everybody corralled over here. And in this tank behind me, I have a living stony that's keeping everybody corralled. Hopefully, this is going to 
be better when I put them all into the 210. I'm almost tempted to put them all into the 55 right now and, and just let them battle it out and figure out their pecking order and then switch them. Even put the Eureka Red in there just to make it interesting. And, uh, but I'm hoping with the 210 that's going to sort out. Or I'm going to end up with a 210-gallon guppy community. A sorority tank. <laughs> Probably not. You know what? Worst case scenario, if these fish just turn into a giant battle royale and, and I and I reach my wit's end, I just put the South Americans in the 210. Those viejas are going to get huge. The Starry Knight, who's not a South American, he's from Madagascar, an island off the coast of Africa. The Starry Knight is going to get over 10 inches. He's going to be super thick. He would love this 210-gallon aquarium. As it is, I'm probably going to have to get a 125 to put that, that the Starry Night is going to need at least a 125. So, and probably the Viejas too. Those Severums get huge. So, uh, at any rate, things to consider when you're going to get, when you're setting up a new tank. And uh, if you think of any more, let me know. And uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. I do read your comments. I don't always respond. I don't have all, you know, the, the time to get to all of them, and I apologize, but I do uh, I do read them. The um, what did you think of of a midweek? Did you like a midweek live stream? Did you enjoy that? Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about possibly continuing or not continuing. I've got a survey going on right now at the channel. I love the live the live streams, having you right there and interacting on the chat and things of that nature. So uh, let me know. Let me know in the comments what you think about a midweek uh, live stream. And also, if you go to the community page on YouTube, you go to my, if you go to my community page, you'll see that there's a survey where you can answer the survey question. And let's see. We went over 38,000 subscribers. That kind of, I blinked and we were over 38. It looks like we're headed for 39 now. That's very, very cool. I really appreciate that. And, uh, and of course, uh, for some reason, the Facebook group seems to be stuck at 7,400, excuse me, 7,400 members. I don't know why, uh, Instagram followers continue to grow. And, uh, but if you're watching right now and you haven't subscribed, why not hit that subscribe button now? And, uh, if you like the content, give it a thumbs up and consider hitting that bell. And just remember we're the, uh, only, only channel on YouTube that offers a 100% money back guarantee. <laughs> I could never finish that without laughing. Why is that? All right, let me take a look at your comments. And uh, before we end off here, and uh, 126, I see, 120-something people on. And uh, let's take a look here what you've been talking about. Very often it has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Let's see. Sean, I'm late. Hey, buddy, you are totally okay if you're late. Uh, you don't have to bring a note. You don't have to give an excuse. I just appreciate that you support the channel. And uh, I really love the comment you made on the midweek live stream. I really, really appreciated that comment. Uh, Solar King, hello, Solar King. Solar King, Ronnie is here. I like direct sunlight on my grow out tank. And I have a nice, healthy algae, which they can graze on. There you go. That's a very, very true point. The uh, algae is, is a very good thing. Adds oxygen. It adds oxygen. It consumes nitrates, right? And ammonia. And uh, the fish eat it. It's a very good thing. I was running algae scrubbers. If you go back to my older videos, I was running algae scrubbers. And I would open them up and let the fish munch on them and they would go nuts on on that algae so uh yeah for sure and i don't i don't i, I actually like seeing green algae now the tanks behind me have for some reason something has changed in the tanks maybe they've, they've become more as cory at the aquarium co-op likes to say they've become more seasoned but i'm getting more green algae than brown algae when it's on the side panels in the back i leave it alone only on the viewing front panel do I clean it up. Otherwise, I leave green algae alone. I like green algae. 
Now, I'm not going to put it in a direct, completely open window because I don't want the tank overrun with algae. That being said, it's nice to have a window occasionally available to film the fish in sunlight. There's nothing like a sunlit fish. The colors are just spectacular. One of my favorite things. So let's see here. Free swimmer. I ran plumbing through the wall from master bath. Has hot and cold options for temp control to fill tank with a twist of the valves. Very, very cool. Yeah, if you're handy or you, um, or you want to, you know, you have the money to pay for something like that, get a plumber in there and do something like that. That's like best of all worlds. In my case, I had to, someone came, I think it was about, about 600 bucks. He had to drill, he had to drill holes in the wall behind me and tap into the lines, the water lines, and I end up with a hot and cold sink right here in the garage, So, which was something I really wanted that. I really wanted to have that availability. But, yeah, what you did is awesome. That's an awesome, uh, awesome solution. Let's see here. I'm going through your, your uh, comments now if you have any any. Any um, questions, certainly add them to the chat, and I will get to them. I'm scrolling back here. Solar King, my grandson put a cup of milk on my 10-gallon hospital tank last night. You know, uh, <laughs> fortunately it didn't fall in. I don't know, is milk lethal to fish? Maybe, I don't know. It would probably do something to the pH. It tends to go a little bit acidic, right? The, uh, I had a, uh, when I was, when I was very, very young, my mom had a party at the house and I stayed and anyone who's from a Latin family, you know what the parties are like. I'm talking loud music. There was, we're talking sixties. Um, yeah, 1961, 62, I'm dating myself, but the, uh, there was cigarette smoke very loud salsa music, and uh, when I woke up in the morning, there were a couple cigarette butts in my aquarium, and I was as furious as a six-year-old can be, and uh, I think my mom just laughed at me. Amon says that I watch my fish more than TV, much more entertaining, headphones and good music. You know, you're, you're right. You're, before, this, uh, before this stream started, I was blasting uh, Pink Floyd. The walls were trembling, and uh, I would have let it keep playing, except my, my video would be taken down uh, because, uh, I, because of copyright issues. <laughs> uh, David Glass, love watching my fish. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's great. It's so relaxing. I think it lowers blood pressure based on scientific studies. Or, Solar King Ronnie, father lives in South Carolina, has to fill up a garbage can and use an aerator for a few days because his ammonia. Yeah, I've heard that ammonia is now being added as part of the water treatment now. They're actually, maybe they've been doing it all along, and I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, definitely not an expert in that area, but um, again, test your tap. Test your tap. You never know what they're going to do, and they're not going to call you up and ask you, do you have fish? Oh, by the way, we're adding a big dose of ammonia. To, they're not going to do that. They're just going to do it, and you're going to find out about it when your fish are, uh, as one person mentioned, start backstroking. GP, I've had kids slap my tank so much. Yeah, that would not be, uh, you know, with a grandchild on the way, I have a granddaughter coming in October, our first granddaughter, and some of the stuff I'm thinking about. Okay, I know I'm going to want to bring her. I want to bring her to the fish room. And uh, hopefully there's not going to be a lot of slapping going on. <laughs> a lot of tank slapping. All right, let's see here.
Brandon, having just gone through this exercise, I advise a spreadsheet and shopping around for the best deals. You are absolutely right, my friend. I, uh, I have a, uh, here's one list. Here's just one list. Eleven and five by eight by eleven and five by eight cut glass uh, for the sump baffles. Uh, GE's number one silicone or aquarium silicone. Two ten foot by one and a half inch PVC pipes. Uh, PVC cutter. Uh, <laughs> sandpaper or a deburr reamer. Unions three one and a half inch unions. A one and a half inch gate valve. Six. What is this? 90 degree, one and a half inch, 90 degree elbows, PVC elbows, order, uh, what is this, filter socks and holders, Velomax for the background. Okay, anyway. <laughs> yes, make a list or you'll go crazy. And on the list, write, write down how much you paid and who it's coming from because you'll lose track. Like, wait a minute, did I ever get that Velomax? Did I order it on, on eBay? On Amazon or from a private, if you have a list and, you know, you you can go, oh, yeah, Velomax, Amazon. Okay, good. Go on to Amazon. Check the status of my order. So otherwise, yes, it gets, as the thumbnail shows, it gets overwhelming real quick. GP is suggesting PTC, PTC heaters over glass tube heaters. Interesting. ETC heaters. Okay. Solar King says hit the like button. Thank you, Solar King. And let's see here. Any questions? Go ahead and ask them now. We're on the hour. Yorel's fishes. Would it be a bad idea to put a blood parrot cichlid fish in a Mabuna tank? Not going to do it. But I am curious. I've heard blood parrots can hold their own. And um, I think that the big concern, the biggest concern would be um, compatibility. Can blood parrots do okay in a very uh, high, high pH, hard water? I, I don't know. I mean, look at, look at water parameters. That'd probably be the biggest. But I've heard blood parrots, and um, I'd probably consider uh, a red devil first before I'd consider that. Carrie, is it Carrie Pills? Carrie Pills? I hope I'm pronouncing that right. My grandkids have all sat in their high chairs in front of the tanks. Now, that I think would be very cool. Now, if they're eating, I would be a little concerned about a food fight, but otherwise, uh, <laughs> I think that would be, I think it'd be a great picture. To take a picture that you can show them years later, especially if one of them gets into uh, gets into aquarium keeping. You're right, Tyler. Tyler is correct on this, and I can hear some splashing behind me. Uh, yes, they can be a pleasure to watch because of the wonderful colors, or they can be uh, just uh, very frustrating as you watch them uh, chase and uh, harass each other. So, uh, Zen Ginger, thank you for your help today. And thank you to uh, KG, to Kevin, to GP, and also, of course, to Denny. And for those of you who still are wondering about Candy, I think she's just very, very tied up with her new responsibilities over with uh, the Aquarium Co-op. She's now, like, um, like Zenzo, she's an employee of the Aquarium Co-op. And I believe she's... Uh, that's probably where she's going to uh, going to be staying and uh, working. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if she'll ever come back as a moderator. We're on good terms as far as I know. I don't think I upset her. I don't think I uh, said anything that upset her. But who knows? <laughs> all right. So with that being said, thank you, everybody. Thank you to all you Super Chatters for the help and support. And... Uh, if you were the first on the chat, be sure to send me your email address. And uh, I'm sorry, be sure to send your address to my email at ben.o.cichlid. And I will go ahead and get out, you know, get out that, uh, 
uh, get out those stickers to you if you would like some stickers. All right. And I'm not sure what video, if a video is going to be out tomorrow. I'm just very, very jammed up uh, because in the middle of everything that I'm doing, and let me just move this. You're going to hear a chair scraping here. Sounds like an elephant. In the middle of everything I'm doing, I have to take care of these tanks. I'll show you the night. Here's the 90 gallon. There's my friend, the uh, yellow Severum. It looks like a line in the tank. That's just the lights reflecting from the other tanks on the 90. But you can see the Vieja right there by the front, a couple of the AC Hecalis. And let's see, let's see if they respond to me. Don't you love it when fish interact with you? Let's take a close up at the other tanks. But like I said, I think one of the fish is the fish are corralling each other today. That little dragon blood is just a real jerk fish. And uh, I tell you, it's going to be a, a, a bit of a battle royale, I think, when I put all the cichlids together, the African cichlids. I think that dragon blood is either going to. Uh, be a problem or he's going to get a real severe reality adjustment from one of the other fish and uh in the tank behind me immediately behind me what you'll see is the um the living the living stone eye Nimbochromus living stone eye. See how he's all blue? He's all fired up. There's no females in there. I don't know why he's so fired up and what's, what's got him going like that. But um, he tends to keep everybody kind of corralled. So I've got two very distinct tank bosses. A living stone eye in one tank and a dragon blood in the other. So it's going to be very interesting when I throw these guys together and I put the Eureka Red in there, who is, we know, a very, very uh, headstrong, very, very aggressive fish. There's going to be some very interesting times. There he is. That's what a jerk fish looks like. <laughs> he's a beautiful jerk, but he's a jerk. And that's what a jerkfish looks like. <laughs> All right. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much. You are very, very appreciated. You truly do rock. I mean that. And, uh, I hope to see you this coming week, this coming this next Saturday at the Cichlids and Coffee live stream. And uh, until then, my friends, you take care. Have a great weekend. And uh, that's it for me. Bye-bye.